on this week's edition of Final Whistle ATX, we wrap up Austin FC's first season and look ahead to the next one. Welcome to the final episode of the season here on Final Whistle ATX, coming to you from BD Riley's. Amazing. The, the season last is cheers over. of the year. Cheers, cheers guys. guys. Cheers. We did it. We made it through I'm gonna enjoy this one. first season. And it took a little bit, but we're all reunited again to talk about uh, the, the first inaugural season of uh, Austin FC. And uh, just before we get to any thoughts about the season, we have to give a big congratulations to the organization that put together such an amazing group of fans. I mean, I think every Man. other stadium and uh, team are jealous of the fan base we have. And after just one season, I think it could only get better. As my biggest takeaway of the year so far is that we, we rule Texas. So far. We rule Texas with eight wins in this season. I think we rule Texas. I don't know if it's even an argument at this point. I'm a little bit nervous about Wyatt having his best take of the season so far when the season's <laughs> literally finished. But apart from that, I couldn't agree more. Did I say best? I meant to say my biggest. I don't know. Ah, uh, same it, thing. It's, it's all in the past now. But so yeah, what do you guys think of the first season? <laughs> it was great fun. It was like an adventure. Um, we we learned a lot about the team as we went through the season. I feel like we came to like several different conclusions that changed a few days later, which was <laughs> a fun adventure. Yeah. Um, we welcomed Q2 Stadium for the first time, and that was unbelievable. That was, I think, my biggest highlight of the season was seeing those home games and seeing the place absolutely rocking and just having this uh, this world class arena really just in the heart of Texas. Um, so, yeah, it, it's been a wild ride. Um, we get a few months to catch our breath, and then we do it all over again. And, Wyatt, you went to your first uh, That's right. home game, uh, the second to last game of the season. That's uh, the right. It was awesome. It was awesome. It was, it was, well, you know this as well as anybody. I think it was like 45 degrees. There yeah, was, was a chance of thunder. There was a chance of rain. But I couldn't let myself go through the first season without going to one game, and that was the last opportunity I had. So I did it, and... It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. I did not sit in the supporter section. If there's anybody out there who hasn't been to a game and the season's over, but next year, get on that waiting list for the supporter section because I can see it. And, like, they just have beer parties for no reason there. Like, there's not a goal scored. They're just throwing beer. I, I hope it's water, actually, because that's... Beer's it's a expensive. Waste of beer, yeah. Beer's a little bit expensive. I, I've been in there and it's not water. It's not water. No. Wow. No. I don't know how that's choreographed, but it's like they all know exactly when to do it. They do it, like, five times during the game. But... Uh, the one thing I'm jealous about with you, Harley, is that the time that you went to the game was after we'd been in lockdown for so long. And I feel like that's part of the story of Austin FC this year because it came at a time where we really needed something to bring us all together. And Austin FC was that. For the people in Austin who, were, who became diehard Austin FC fans, and you were there the first game, uh, and you talked about it barely because we could barely understand you with your, with your voice broken. <laughs> but my experience was awesome. I went with my wife. But I'm jealous of your experience having it been the first live experience you probably had in what was it a year and a half yeah uh it and was, did you sit in the supporter section uh for, so i was at the very first game which was the san jose game and that was unbelievable but it was a nil nil draw and then i was there again for the in the supporter section for the game against portland timbers which is the one that you're talking about when i had the raspy voice when we recorded the next <laughs> day which was not the smartest decision from my perspective <laughs> um but it was an amazing night i was in the supporter section that was my favorite game of the season my favorite memory of the season we we were there with some friends and we were all just like partying for most of the 90 minutes it was so much fun why what was your takeaway from the season as a whole uh whether you've been to a game or not but you had uh but but looking at the team uh how far have they come what do they still have to learn i really feel like us having trouble scoring didn't feel like as big of a problem in the last i, I didn't sense it as as big of a problem because i think driussi and, and gta finally settling in and fagunda is becoming clearly the leader of this team um and cecilio kind of being able to be the third guy maybe the second guy i think the third behind driussi and fagundes um i i left feeling optimistic at the end of the year at the end of the last home game i should say um i really think we're only a few pieces away from contention. I know we're going to get into who we think should stay, who potentially we could see leaving or we wouldn't mind to see leaving. Uh, but without getting too much into that yet, I, I really feel like we're only a few pieces away. Some of the most important positions, we kind of have guys who we think answer some questions for that. I think Claudio Reyna has proven we can trust him to make some smart decisions in the offseason. Uh, he, he didn't bat 100 with his picks. I think Redes, Redes might... Uh, 
have a word about that. But but no, the guy was incredible. He brought in some guys who we didn't even know their name, and they ended up being stalwarts for the U.S. or for the U.S. Uh, for Austin FC. So my takeaway of the season is I'm feeling optimistic. I'm feeling really optimistic. I think we've got a lot of our chess pieces where they need to be. You could probably break the season down into thirds. Great start. Like, blew everyone's expectations away the first few games when we were having to play away, remember, for mm-hmm. several games because Q2 wasn't ready yet. Uh, and then things sort of went downhill middle of the season. <laughs> way more losses. Cheap After goals, a few playoff predictions. Bad defenses. <laughs> and no, you know, we weren't even scoring. And then things improved from a scoring perspective at the end of the season. We got a few wins under our belt, scoring at home, winning at home a, a few times. Uh, so I break it down into into thirds in that way. Uh, and in a way, certainly better that we ended on that final third than how it was in the middle of the season where we were sort of losing a little hope on the team. Yeah, we, st- we started off being pretty poor going forward, but really tight at the back. And then something switched mid-season, I guess about the time that Driussi and Gite start coming into the team, like you said, Wyatt. And then suddenly Austin looked great going forward and a super leaky at the back. Um, Brad Stuver had a great season, legendary first season. <laughs> um, he was definitely better in the first half of the season. We saw a few more mistakes from him in the second half of the season. Um, so yeah, kind of a shame that we didn't get to see the best defense at the same time as the best attack. I think that would have been really hard to stop. Um, but hey, we, we had a good time. We made some memories along the way. It's all about the thrill of the ride, baby. One thing that was cool is I think our offense changed, too. We went from a really dominant possession-oriented game. The game that I was at, the last home game, if I remember right, I think we only had like 40% possession. If I, and I could be wrong, but I remember looking up. The whole first half, the beginning of the second half, we were in the high 30s, the low 40s. But every time we had the ball, we were moving forward, we were attacking. Uh, and so that's a drastic difference from the way we started the season, uh, speaking of how the season went. And I think that that was part of the reason I feel like more optimistic about us being able to score goals because we were actually way more attacking. Yeah, and I, I hope Josh Wolf has learned to relax a little bit because I was getting on him early in the season for being too stubborn and sticking to his guns no matter what. And I think we saw a little bit more flexibility with the shape of the team, the tactics, the way he wanted them to play. And I hope that he comes out of the season thinking that maybe he can give his players a bit more trust. Maybe he can switch up the game plan if things aren't working rather than just like stubbornly sticking to one thing. So I hope that he has learned a lot of lessons along the way as well. Who do we think, if you had a a list of say five players you really want to hang on to and keep for next season, let's keep it at five. Ooh. uh, Who would your five be? (laughs) And you can sort of go back and forth, and I'm sure you could agree on some of them. Like I'll, I'll list Brad a few Stuver. if you want to go a few after. Yeah, so, so that let's way do it's it. not like five, five, five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the first guy, and he's got to be the first on the list, has to be Jerusi. Yep. Um, check. Check that off. I think Fagundes arguably could be the check. first, only because he's really the leader of this team, along with Stuver. But Fagundes, you see on the field everywhere. Um, I, I, I was only going to do two, but I think Stuver's the obvious third. But you can go ahead with the, with the next few. You can have Stuver. I'll give you that. That was that was going <laughs> to happen. Um, I'll throw in uh, Zan Kolmanic, who I've just talked about a whole lot this season because I think he's been amazing, like thrown into the action when Ben Sweat got hurt so early and just made that left back spot his own. And he's only young. He's going to get better. He's got such a good delivery on him. You absolutely keep him. If anything, because, you know, he's so much younger than these other guys, even if it doesn't work out, you can probably get some money for him down the road if you sell him. And then this might be more of a controversial one. Wyatt went first and took the easy ones, so whatever. (laughs) Uh, But I'll put Alex Ring on there. I know that he's not beloved universally by the fan base but for me there's an enormous difference in Austin FC with and without Alex Ring and I much prefer the version of the team that's with Alex Ring so I think it's imperative that he stays as well. He became a a guy that we could trust moving forward with the ball too during the season which I didn't think he could it's not that I didn't think he could do it but we just was the defensive stopper and then he kind of became a guy who the king of the headers at Q2 Stadium for a game or two there and and not just that, he created a lot of opportunities for others. So that's, I, don't, I don't see that as being, I thought you were going to go with a different defensive mid for, throw it, for somebody. Throw it, out, throw it out there. I'll let you do. You know who I'm talking about. Oh, you're talking about Danny Pereira. Uh, of course. Uh, yeah. It's, I thought you were going to say him. That's part of my brand. Cole Minich and Pereira <laughs> is my brand. So yeah, Danny as well. That's six. So we're starting to get, but five is a bit unfair. We're, we've got to keep more than five players. Musa Gite as well deserves a shout out because I think he really changed how Austin FC played down the stretch and He's got so much potential, so there's plenty of guys to build around, I think. All right, let me flip it this way, and this one you can't repeat. Two <laughs> players that you get rid of that you don't want to see. I don't know if Austin I get rid FC of this jersey. player, but we were talking before we started recording, or I was, I was telling Harley I want to talk about Pochettino. 
I'm not saying we should get rid of him, but I feel like he's the kind of guy who's right in the middle of should we get rid of him, should we let him stay. Personally, I, I would love to keep Pochettino, but I don't think he should be a designated player for us because he didn't perform like a designated player. You can't be a team in the MLS and expect to contend and not have three DPs who are performing consistently for your team. I think he's a great uh, bench option. I think he can start a lot of games too, but he's just one of those guys I, I, I don't mind having him around, but I think we saw who he was this year. Over the course of the year, he's inconsistent. He's got great moments. He's got moments where he looks sloppy and like he doesn't care. So I'd love to see him stick around, but if he's going to be designated player, I, honestly, I'd rather, I'd rather let him go. Those designated player spots are so valuable. Yeah. And yeah. if you think about it like this, right, if you roll a dice and, and it comes up and you roll a two and, and you t say to me, oh, you can roll it again and try and get a better number, then surely you'd, you'd roll it again and try and do better. And that's, ki that's kind of how I feel to an extent, like move on from Pochettino and bring in another DP who could have like a Drew like impact on this team. In reality, it doesn't work like that because it's not just that easy to just find someone who could be great. And also part of it is that, you know, this is his first season playing in a new country in a new league and he could take massive steps forward over the off season and be a big part of the team next season. So yeah, that's that's a tricky one. Uh, I'll throw out another unpopular one. Uh, I don't know if you guys will be surprised, but Cecilio Dominguez, right. kind of for the same reason. I know he was, he ended up as the joint top scorer, although some of those goals were penalties, <laughs> so a little bit hashtag justice for Fagundes there. Um, <laughs> but uh, so what was it seven goals? I don't know if that's anything to brag about for being a top scorer on the team. Yeah, I mean, it was it was just okay, wasn't it, from Cecilio? And it was a lot of times where it felt like it was below okay, and it felt very frustrating to watch. So I don't know if he makes the team better. I, I gotta I, I gotta I come know. to the defense because I think that he was out of position most of the season, and I know that's not an excuse for a guy who we would call, before Driussi got here, the most talented person on our team. Um, but I just don't think he was in the right position the whole season. And we struggled as a team the whole season. I don't know that I necessarily blame him for all of it um, because it's really hard to be a winger when you don't have that number nine. And then when we did put him at number nine, it felt like we were at a deficiency at winger. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think in the right circumstance, I think with Driussi and Fugundes on the right and Gite, I think he can be at his best. It's weird we didn't see him play as much down the stretch here. He came off the bench. I don't know if that's fitness related or we just wanted to see other guys play. I, I, um, it's tough because we've talked about John Gallagher a lot on this show and, and he didn't get an awful lot of minutes, especially towards the end of the season. Had a lot of times where he came on as a sub. If you flipped Cecilio's minutes with Gallagher's minutes, do you really think there's a difference in the performance of the team? I'm not really sure there Cecilio is. Cecilio can do a lot more than Gallagher. I, I love me some John Gallagher, but I think that... Oh, you do. I think Cecilio can do more things than he can, don't you think? The, the ceiling with Cecilio, no pun intended, is higher, I think, than Gallagher. Yeah, you're probably right. I just some but also the he costs, ceiling. How much does he cost? Uh, like four times more than Gallagher? So I guess, you know. I'm not, I'm not letting you get away with that Cecilio <laughs> joke. That was terrible. All right. Big picture. What changes or doesn't change in the offseason? Do we stick with Wolf? Are there other yeah. changes mentality-wise, uh, formation-wise? big picture style now they don't cut ties with wolf in the off season and here's why because austin fc has never had a proper off season before in terms of that that three month turnaround in between the two seasons so at this point you stick with wolf because the home form was good to end the season it was much better the team was playing probably better towards the end of the season than it has at any other point not on the road they were dreadful on the road but whatever um I think you stick with him and you and you give him the start of next season at least, obviously, and see how things go. Um, I don't think his job security is as secure going into year two as it was going into year one. And we've all seen some things that have been red flags for us. Uh, but Wolf definitely stays. But I think the defense gets a little bit of a reshaping. I don't know if Matt Beasler comes back. Um, he got a pretty nasty concussion and then didn't play again, which is just worrying about the guy, let alone the player. And he's getting up there in years. So... I think that's that centre back is such an important position, and I think you fill in there somebody to maybe go with Cascante. I would like to see another option in attack. Uh, I really like Musa Gite, but I think maybe another number nine, uh, and then another another body in midfield would be nice as well. Wyatt, I, I want to try and answer the question you just asked along with the question you asked before because I don't feel like I really answered it with my soliloquy on Pochettino. But to go with what you said, I think. Not necessarily who I want to see leave, which I think was the question you asked, but who I expect to see leave. I think Be I think Beisler. Um, but I think we really need some reinforcements in the back. I, I was kind of going back and forth with who to throw in there, whether it was Beisler or Cascante, because I think they both played well at times. Um, but we need 
more consistency in the back. I wouldn't mind seeing two more defenders come in. Um, not that they need to come in and, and t both take the starting spot, but we need more competition there. Because Alex Ring going back there, I don't think he performed all right, but the fact that he was our only option kind of scared me a little bit, like we need more options back there. And the second person uh, who I think we might see leave, I don't know how you're going to feel about it, Nick Lima, because I think... <laughs> Flip this table. Sorry, BD Riley. I just don't think he has... I, I don't think he has as much versatility in the back as uh, as as his counterpart. It's not that I don't like him. I just I would like to see us improve at that position, especially if we're going to play Josh Wolf style. The left back and the fullbacks are really important to that style between being able to move forward and come back and be fast. They're asked to do a lot, which is why Kolmanich was so impressive this year because he was so great at it. But I would love to see an improvement over Nick Lima. I don't know how many better right backs there are in the MLS than Nick Lima because uh, it's just a hard position to find and the MLS is not drowning with with incredible right backs who can play that style. Um, but that, I think, to me, I guess to answer your second question is defense. I think we really need to see an improvement on defense. We definitely need some more guys that forward, too. Uh, Gite, I don't know if he can hold up a whole season. He barely held up for the 10 games we had him. He was impressive when he was there. But I think we need some more bodies at forward and at uh, and the defense. And if we keep Pochettino, I really feel okay with our midfield. I, I, I personally do. So it's going to be way too early to make predictions for next season because so much is going to change in the off season, and we don't know who will keep and who will go. But where realistically should we be looking for next season? Is it just uh, playoff contention, just higher up the table? What would be considered kind of the expectation for next season? It's a big question. Um, big show. I think <laughs> that... In year two, they have to... Uh, it's tricky. I, I think they have to at least challenge for the playoffs. Um, it, a lot of teams don't do that most years, so it's not like we have this like right to be there because, because Austin FC doesn't have a right to be there. But you want to see progress. Year one's been very up and down, more down than up. And I, I think you want to see improvement across the team. I want that atmosphere at Q2 to be maintained more than anything else. And, yeah, I think they should be at least challenging for the playoffs, if not making it in there in the West. I think that Austin FC has branded, them, has branded themselves as a team um, that wants to be excellent at everything they do. We want to have an excellent youth system. We want to have an excellent facility and, and stadium. We want to have an excellent coaching staff and, and, and an excellent front office and, and excellent players. Um, and I know that sounds like it would be obvious, but I don't think you can say that across the entire MLS. That's necessarily what they want or what they're necessarily making their brand be. Yeah, so definitely. I, I definitely. think it's hard not to say, like, I think we should be not just competing for the playoffs. I think we should be competing for high seeds and making runs in the playoffs. I know we're only in year two, but if that's the standard that we're trying to set for ourselves, I think that has to be the expectation. And we have a lot of good pieces. We've talked about tonight how many pieces we're excited about for next year. We'll have Drew Yusey for an entire season. We'll have Gite finally maybe a little bit more fit, uh, who also will be here for a full season. And along with the reinforcements that Claudio Reyna, who I think all three of us agree, is a more than qualified GM in the MLS. He was at New York City FC before this. This is not his first rodeo. Um, so I think the, the pressure will be on Josh Wolf early because I think – Austin FC expects not just to make the playoffs next year, but to compete. So if Josh Wolf shows up in the first month, the first two months, and he's not winning games, maybe he's not even winning games the way that we expect to win games in a city like Austin with the fan base like we have, uh, I think he's going to be on the hot seat really fast if he doesn't perform early. And my expectation is for us to compete for the MLS Cup. Well, I don't know if it's realistic, but that's, that's what they've kind of been telling us since we started the season and, and before. So... One thing that would help is if you keep talking smack about Nick Lima, because famously, every time you say <laughs> something bad about Nick Lima, Nick Lima does something awesome. That's like right true. then, when you said about moving on from him, he's like at home and he's like, <laughs> he's like fired a piece of paper into the he trash. He just invested in Bitcoin like, right when yeah. I said that. Yeah. He's, he's like, that was weird. Why did that happen? <laughs> but it was just because of you. So. All right, quickly, before we wrap things up, favorite moment of the season for you both? You go first. <sighs> this is really hard. I have a lot of really uh, moments that I was excited about. Being at the game was really fun, and the reason it was fun was all the things aside from the game. Like walking, I had to park a little bit further away, but walking, like, and you're kind of in a line with all the Austin FC fans, and you start to smell the foods that's at the stadium, uh, and you can kind of feel the excitement, and everyone around you is happy and smiling. I really missed that, and that's one of my favorite memories of this year is being reminded how fun it is to have a team in your city that you actually care about, uh, which hasn't been the case 
before this, at least for me. So um, I think just being there, but not just the game. It was just like being in the whole thing. You know, like I love, I love the entire environment about it. And the fact that it was built up so much because like everyone knows how much fun it is to be there. My first game was the last game of the year and it, and it lived up to everything I was expecting. So that has to be probably my favorite moment of the, of the season for me. Harley? For, for me, it was that very first home game on that scorching hot summer day outside Q2 Stadium. And the game itself was, as, as far as the game of soccer goes, it was fairly forgettable. But yeah. for me, it was before the game um, when the, the bus that's carrying the Austin FC players drives past the outside of the stadium and there's just this swarm of fans and it's just the atmosphere was absolutely crazy like singing and chanting and people pulling in behind and walking behind the bus and banners and flags and green and black everywhere it was incredible um just such that was the moment more than anything on the pitch that will stick with me because that was just such a feeling of togetherness and before a, a ball had been kicked at Q2 Stadium except for the women's team who had the first game there <laughs> of course, of course. yeah days before <laughs> before a ball had been kicked in the MLS at Q2 Stadium it was like a sign that this was going to be a special arena with a special atmosphere and for me that was like the, the best moment of the season yeah. you so know, what about you a few games in I uh Got to go to a game with my son, but that is not my favorite oh memory my overall. Gosh. Because, you know, he was kind of tired and... <laughs> uh, Minus 12 dad points. Yes. Uh, and he was four at the time and, you know, kind of just wanted to go home and play with jigsaw puzzles. Uh, but, yeah, <laughs> you know, that first game of the season, my favorite as well. The, the sense of anticipation, like all this buildup, years in the making, mm -hmm. was finally coming down to, like, this. You know, you had Matthew McConaughey, like, pounding the drum on the side and getting everyone so into it. You had a little firework or uh, some type of, you know, explosions um, that really just got everyone excited. And, and then watching the game, yeah, I think it was a draw against San Jose. But, um, but it was so great seeing every seat just crammed full. And, uh, you know, what a way to start the season. And I'm looking forward to next season. Um, I think, you know, no doubt uh, enthusiasm will be high at the beginning of the season, expectations higher as well. And it's February. It's not too far away from now. We'll be back. Yeah, at it feels it. like tomorrow. You know what I mean? I, I think I one of my exciting moments of the year, too, was for about three seconds. I really thought we can get McConaughey to join us in the show. And I was <laughs> filled with so much joy. I was like, I can't wait to tell all my friends I got to meet McConaughey. And then you and woke then, up. And then on the fourth second, I was like, it's never good. He's Matthew McConaughey. He has a lot better things to do than come to a pub with us and talk Austin FC. But yeah. maybe next year. We're not going to stop trying. I can put I'll on a that. southern accent if that would help. <laughs> well, we thank sure you. That. We thank you <laughs> no, so I mean, much for you. For, so you uh, that experience. I see. I Sorry, see. Nick's trying to wrap the show. No, no, just no. Like <laughs> I just wanted to say that we thank all of you who've uh, messaged us or... Uh, seen us around and say how much you like the show for uh, for watching i know it's which has happened been by sort the way. of on and off i know that's why i said it yeah i just <laughs> just saying if people don't believe us it I'm really a happened meteorologist. i don't lie <laughs> um but no we uh, appreciate uh, all your commitment to our show that's been somewhat on and off through the season as our schedules have been difficult and all of that uh it's been really fun yeah. uh hanging out with you guys yeah. we don't get uh, to go in front of, of camera very often so this is a whole new experience. Well, for me at least, I can't say I don't know. Movie star over here. Harley's but breaking through now. I know. You but this out. was my first time. This is a lot of fun for me. It's not even remotely close to being true, but thank you anyway. <laughs> uh, and certainly, BD Riley's have been great, uh, allowing us to massive uh, shout out to BD Riley's uh, show every couple of weeks. We've got fish and chips waiting for us when this we is do. up. That's why you're rushing, isn't it? I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, for the final episode of Final Whistle ATX of our first season, thank you so much. Cheers, Cheers guys. Cheers. And uh, we hope to be back next season. <laughs>